Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are now in lesson number 141 in our series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's lesson is entitled David and Bathsheba, Part 9. So last week, we were in the process of getting a picture of the two sides that were involved in a struggle for who was going to succeed King David to the throne. And out of David's many sons, it was Adonijah and Solomon who emerged as the primary contenders. And as we saw, both men had substantial and important people who were supporting them. But when we ended for the night, we still hadn't seen where King David had done anything assertive to clear this matter up. He had at some point in the past made his intention known that Solomon was his choice to succeed him. But, on the other hand, he had made and done nothing to dissuade Solomon's older brother Adonijah from making an unauthorized bid to obtain the kingdom for himself. Now, things had progressed to the point that the king really needed to weigh in before it was too late. And because David was not showing any signs of doing so, it was left to someone else to prod him along. That someone else was Bathsheba. And she herself is going to need some encouragement as well. Seems that things came to a head when Adonijah had proceeded to within a whisker of stealing the throne from Solomon. So we want to begin with that section of the scripture in 1 Kings. We're going to go to chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The scripture reads, And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoholeth, which is by Enrogel and called all his brethren the king's sons, and all the men of Judah the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he called not. So it's not hard to figure out what's going on here. Adonijah was organizing his own coronation gathering his allies together, including all the remaining sons of the king. With one exception, he did not invite Solomon. Nor did he invite anyone mentioned back in verse 8 that we read last week. Those are the same people that are mentioned here in verse 10 as persona non grata. Adonijah did not want to have anyone present who might object to what he was doing. He was planning to become king, and he was going to do it by acclamation. The acclamation of his distinguished company, people that he had handpicked for the occasion. And Adonijah's plan probably would have worked. After all, he was following after the method that David's son Absalom had used previously, and it worked for him. Absalom had acted in much the same way in which Adonijah was now employing. Using that method, Absalom was able to win the hearts of the people and occupy Jerusalem, causing King David to flee the city. Now, admittedly, eventually, David was, in fact, able to reclaim his throne. And Absalom 
was killed. But the present situation seemed much more favorable. And that was because David was ill. And David was near death. And Adonijah figured that David was not going to be in that position a second time to reclaim his throne. And that opinion seems to have been perfectly reasonable. The mistake that Adonijah made was that he underestimated David. And he underestimated the people who were supporting Solomon. He also miscalculated his belief that King David was not going to get off the sidelines that he would not get personally involved. Another problem that Adonijah had was any thought that he could put together such an auspicious gathering very close to Jerusalem and think that the word was not going to get out ahead of time. Because to no one's surprise, it did. The word did get out. And one of the people who found out about it was one of those people that we read about back in verse 8. People who were not invited to attend. And Nathan was not invited for good reason. Nathan, the prophet of God. Let's go to 1 Kings 1 and 11 through 13 and pick this back up. Scripture reads, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith doth reign? And David our Lord knoweth it not? Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel, that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go, and get thee in unto King David. Say unto him, This not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? So Nathan's intentions here are both prudent and understandable. He knows that if this situation is not nipped in the bud, Adonijah will shortly begin to eliminate any potential rivals to the throne, along with anyone else that he deems to be adversarial. Now, there is some level of question here that has been raised as to whether or not David ever made that promise concerning his son, Solomon. That is so because it is not previously recorded in any other place in the scriptures. And some think that, well, Nathan made it up. And he did it in order to persuade David to act. Of course, if that were true, that would put Nathan in the place of being a liar. But neither is there any record here that Nathan was telling Bathsheba anything other than the truth. And Nathan's purpose was to simply remind David of that earlier promise. Um, by the way, I happen to be a man that knows that one's memory does not tend to improve with age. And I'm in the camp with those who choose not to call Nathan a liar without any proof. And there is no proof. So Nathan instructs Bathsheba to get the ball rolling by telling David about the commitment that he had made to Solomon. But Nathan was a careful man. He was one of those people who 
who saw the need for both a belt and suspenders. So I'm going to go to 1 Kings 1.14. The scripture reads, Behold, this is Nathan speaking now, Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. Nathan reasons that because of David's failing health, he may not remember that promise. So he plans to back up Bathsheba's account by telling David the same thing that she had just told him. This was a very serious situation. Nathan was not going to leave anything to chance. Being a man of God, and knowing that David, too, was a man of God, Nathan was going to follow the biblical principles in establishing the veracity of what had been said, what Bathsheba had just told him. Those of us who are Christians may know exactly where I'm going with this, but let's go there just the same. I want to jump all the way up into the New Testament, to the book of Matthew. Matthew 18 and verse 16. Scripture reads, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, of course, this verse is in the midst of a passage about church discipline in the New Testament. And David would not have knowledge of that. And neither would Nathan. True enough. However, Jesus was making an application that was not new. He was taking that principle from the Old Testament. And for that, we need to go back to the Old Testament again. This time, way back to Deuteronomy, chapter 17 and verse 6. Scripture reads, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. So it seems whether you are talking about criminal justice or civil justice or church justice, the principle is the same. The truth of any matter, at least in human experience, can only be established by at least two people. That's a standard that comes from God's Word. And David was a man who not only knew God's Word, he actually wrote down a good bit of it in the Psalms. If David's wife asserted a truth, a promise, or asserted something as truth, a promise that he had previously made, and God's prophet subsequently affirmed it, well, David would be heavily convicted to believe it. So let's see what happens. Go to 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. Scripture reads, And Bathsheba went in unto the king into the chamber. And the king was very old. And Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What wouldest thou? And she said unto him, My Lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now behold, Adonijah reigneth. And now, my Lord the king, thou knowest it not. I want us to give consideration to something here. Oh, I'm sorry. We are going to finish this passage, don't we? Verse 19. And he hath slain oxen. This is talking about Adonijah. And he hath slain oxen and fat cattle 
and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the king, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it shall come to pass, when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. So now that we finish that passage, that we want to give us consideration to something. And this is a conversation um, that is occurring right now. The one that we're seeing between David and Bathsheba. This conversation really is the only words that we have attributed to Bathsheba prior to this time. The only time we have anything from her actually in the scriptures was the message that she gave to David uh, when she became pregnant with their first child. And if you recall, that was sent to David via a messenger. It was not face to face. So as prominent as Bathsheba was in David's life, this conversation in 1 Kings chapter 1 is all the dialogue that we have from Bathsheba between these two people. And what Bathsheba is telling David is quite dramatic. If this person, Adonijah, someone that David had not authorized to succeed him, is not stopped immediately, then both she and Solomon, her son, will most likely be put to death as threats to the new king. So I would assume that even in his weakened state, David would have no problem understanding the gravity of the situation. In fact, he would have known that the danger to life and limb would have included himself. If he had placed his support to Solomon and Adonijah became king, then David too would have been viewed as an opponent. So while David is trying to absorb what he had just been told, Nathan executes the second phase of his plan to prod David into action. So that will go to 1 Kings 1, 22 through 27. Scripture reads, And lo, while she, Bathsheba, yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen, and fat cattle, and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons, and the captains of the host, and Abiathar the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, and say, God save King Adonijah, but me, even me thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon hath he not called. Is this thing done by my lord the king? And thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. So now Nathan too is explaining everything that Adonijah is doing to make himself king. And David is hearing that right after Bathsheba 
has reminded him that it was his own decision that Solomon would follow him as king, not Adonai. So after two people whom David loves and trusts have laid out the perilous situation, David can see how Adonai's actions are a direct challenge to his royal decision. A decision that had come from his own mouth. Something that he could not allow to stand. Because if he did, it would put his own life at risk, and the lives of everyone he loved, and everyone who was supporting his earlier decision. David responded to this wake-up call at once. Whatever state of complacency that he had been dealing with was now set aside. It was gone. Let's go to the scriptures. 1 Kings 128. Scripture reads, Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. So apparently, when Nathan had come into David's bedchamber, Bathsheba at that time left the room to allow these two men to speak privately. Now, after Nathan leaves, David calls for Bathsheba to come back. He wants her to know what it is that he plans to do. So let's go back to the scriptures, 1 Kings 1, 29 through 31. Scripture reads, And the king sware, and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord King David live forever. So David makes a proclamation that he's going to turn everything around. And before the day is out, Solomon is going to be sitting on the throne of Israel. And out of relief and joy, Bathsheba makes that famous prophecy. Essentially, that the spirit of David would live forever. And in more ways than one, it has done just that. If you recall, we've already spent some time on Bathsheba's prophecy, the one we just read, about five months ago. Uh, it was actually during our introduction to David. And at that time, we were talking about how the Jews had put great stock in this particular verse. So I'm not going to repeat that discussion now, but you can go back and review that lesson if you want to, to get the whole story. And that would be found in Lesson 107, keeping in mind that all the lessons in this series are available for review. So clearly... David's response to Bathsheba's reminder about David's oath concerning Solomon is being received as she had hoped, and as how Nathan had hoped. Now, David moves on to the details of action. Action that he is not going to put off for one more minute. Let's go back to 1 Kings. Chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. The scripture reads, King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and call Solomon my son, to ride upon mine own mule and bring him down to Gihon. 
And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there king over Israel. And blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. So now David is finally moving, and he's moving fast. There's going to be no fooling around. David not only calls Nathan back, but he now includes most of the principles that we saw back in verse 8. The ones who were not with Adonijah and who were not invited to his attempted self-coronation. David says, you get the royal mule, my own mule, the king's mule, the mule that no one rides on except the king. You put my son Solomon on that mule, and you parade him down to Gihon, and you do it right now. And when you get there, I want God's priest and God's prophet to anoint him king of Israel. And I don't want you to be shy about it. I want you to blow the trumpets, and I want everybody to shout, God save King Solomon. A little bit later, we're also going to find out that Nathan, Zadok, Benaiah, had also gathered a great multitude of people to participate in this. So now this is getting interesting. You've already learned back in verse 9 that Adonijah was having his so-called self-coronation at Enrogel. Now we see that David is ordering Solomon to be anointed king at Gihon. So let's see what David is doing from a visual perspective. This is going to be on Exhibit 156 entitled Enrogel and Gihon. Now there are a lot of cities on here, but if you look at this slide, at the bottom of this big red teardrop and about the center, there is a dot that shows the location of Gihon. Gihon was actually a spring that provided water to Jerusalem. And there were symbolic reasons to have Solomon anointed at that spring. And just to the south of Gihon, very, very close by, is Enrogel. And when I say it's just to the south, I mean just. It's actually less than one mile. And the city of Jerusalem is not much farther. They're all three of these locations very tightly packed together. So David decides that he's going to set up a competing coronation right on the top of Adonijah's, right in his face. The implication of that, and the purpose of that, at least certainly part of the purpose of that, is pretty clear. Adonijah and his supporters are declaring him to be king at Enrogel. But they are literally within shouting distance of the supporters of David, who are proclaiming Solomon as king in Gihon. So now the ball is going to be in Adonijah's court. The only way that he could prevail was to take on King David. Then and there. In what would have been a bloody fight. The question is, does Adonijah and his supporters have the stomach for it? And will those supporters stick with him in the face of David's mighty men and all the other supporters of Solomon? David reasoned, and he reasoned rightly, that if he acted quickly with a great show of strength and power, he could stamp out Adonijah's threat in short order. 
So, after they anointed Solomon as king at Gihon, they were instructed to then seal the deal in a way that would be unmistakable. Let's go to 1 Kings, 1, 1 Kings 135. Scripture reads, Then ye shall come up after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne. For he shall be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. So after anointing Solomon at Gihon, this multitude of people were supposed to be making a loud procession, trumpets blaring, back to Jerusalem. And here in this verse, verse 35, is where David carries through on his promise by using language that he had not used before. This is new. Didn't use it when previously discussing the matter of succession. And it was a change that would have raised a level of finality in a way that could not be undone. David had made the decision to go beyond the promise that he had made to Bathsheba, the one that she reminded him of. I'm going to go back a few verses to verse 30, and I want to take note of the change in case you missed it. 1 Kings 1.30, Scripture reads, Even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. So David's promise to Bathsheba was that Solomon would reign as king after David. And, of course, that would have been the normal flow of events. Namely, after the king dies, his successor would begin to reign. But given the present situation, David purposes to move things up. He says that on that very day, the day that he was having this discussion with Bathsheba, Solomon will begin to reign, not after him, but listen, in his stead or in his place. That means while David is yet alive. No one could have expected that. That is an offer by David to abdicate his throne. Now David made that statement to Bathsheba before he called Zadok and the rest of those other supporters into the room. But now, if we go back and consider verse 35 again, David carries through with his promise to Bathsheba, and it is there that he orders his servants to carry it out. And David's servants recognized that what he was saying was both his will, David's will, and the will of God. And so, they were all on board. But of course, there was still the matter of actually executing David's plan. Talking is one thing, and that's all we've been doing up till now. But would the people go along? Would Adonijah put up a fight? Well, Lord willing, we will get to observe how this plan worked out next week. And in doing so, I fully expect, but not promise, <laughs> that we will include our study of the relationship between David and Bathsheba at that time. And that would then allow us to move on to the next person in David's life who left a lasting impression on him. Please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.